Do not forget, you can support the channel with a like and you can also subscribe to be aware of the latest published videos. Thank you. We hope that here you can find the latest news, ideas and discoveries from the scientific world. The Polish zoo that helped hide over 200 Jews. What did it mean when the zookeeper's wife played a certain song on the piano? The meeting of Antonina and Jan Zabinski was one of those encounters where stars explode in the sky and magic starts fizzing. Not that either of them knew of what was to come, that together they were going to provide a beacon of hope to hundreds in one of Poland's very darkest moments. At the time of their meeting, Antonina was an archivist at the Warsaw University of Life Sciences Department of Zoology and Animal Physiology. Jan had studied drawing at the School of Fine Arts and now worked as a researcher in the same department as Antonina. Their love of animals and art drew them together. As a couple, they were unstoppable. In 1929, Jan became the director of the Warsaw Zoological Garden. Once a traveling animal exhibition, the zoo was now permanently situated at the right bank of Warsaw's Vistula River. With the Zabinskis at the helm, the zoo thrived as visitors from far and wide made their way to see the large collection of exotic animals, ever growing as a result of the successful breeding program. In 1937, the zoo was delighted to introduce the first Polish-born elephant. They named her Tuzinka. The couple's passion for the animals was clear to all. Visitors to the Zabinskis' residence on site were often met by the sight of Antonina nursing a sick or injured animal back to health. These animals included lynxes, piglets, cockatoos, a badger, and a muskrat. With such strange house guests combined with Jan and Antonina's contact with the local creative community, the couple's residential villa came to be known as the house under a crazy star. Artists and musicians were free to come and work at the zoo, spend time there to gain inspiration, and even perform in the open air. To Jan, it was important to remind people the zoo was more than just a visitor attraction. First and foremost it was a place where animals could be studied and helped to thrive. It is not enough to research animals at a safe distance, you need to live with them to truly understand their habits and psychology. But the nurturing paradise created by the Zabinskis was about to be shattered. In 1939, Poland was invaded by the German army. The subsequent bombing of Warsaw on September 1st hit the zoo, killing many animals. Jan was faced with a heartbreaking decision. Knowing more bombings could follow, he was faced with the reality that the zoo's predatory animals could escape and roam the streets. He had no choice than to kill them. When it came to the other animals, the decision was taken from Jan's hands entirely. As the German army stormed into the zoo, they organized a spontaneous hunt. Any animal they deemed to be valuable was sent to Germany's Skorfheid Reserve, a nature reserve that Nazis regularly used as a private hunting ground. Many of the zoo's animals that didn't fit their criteria were shot without a second thought. Tuzinka the elephant was taken to the zoo in Koningsberg. The animals that were left became a food source for both Warsaw locals and the army. With the country under Nazi control and the people of Warsaw starving, the Zabinskis had little choice. But they weren't going to let the enemy break them, and the Nazis' persecution of the Jewish population only made them more determined. The zoo had been paradise once and they would do all they could to ensure it remained a place of nurture and safety in the dark days of World War II. They just had to change their tactic. To the German occupiers, Jan Zabinski was a useful asset. He was duly appointed superintendent of Warsaw's public parks. What they didn't know was that he had long been involved in subversive activism. They had just unknowingly given him a free pass to covertly help the Jewish community. When the Warsaw Ghetto was established in 1940, the German authorities began filling it with the Jewish residents of the city. At its height, up to 460,000 Jews were imprisoned in the area, which measured just 3.4 square kilometers. It was the largest of Nazi ghettos created during the war. Those prisoners who hadn't been shot, starved or died of disease, which was rife in the ghetto, were sent to Nazi concentration camps. With his new role as park superintendent, Jan set to work. Incredibly, the authorities granted his request for access to the greenery within the Jewish ghettos, despite the fact there was hardly any to be seen. This access allowed Jan to reconnect with his many Jewish friends and colleagues, bringing in food and messages. Returning to the relative comfort of the abandoned zoo at night, he started breeding pigs and was able to smuggle meat into the starving prisoners. But the Zabinskis knew they could still be doing more. Soon Jan was smuggling false documents into the ghetto, organizing safe houses for those who were able to escape and helping to smuggle them out. Jan, Antonina and their son Richard made the most of their zoo, offering the empty cages as temporary shelter and providing food and other necessities for people in transit to other hideouts. They also opened their own home, the house under a crazy star, to those seeking a place to hide, never turning anybody away, welcoming both friends and strangers. Antonina was adamant that the guests staying in her home must be as free as possible, a possibility allowed by the vastness of the zoo. Allowing them to move around the villa as they pleased, she had one strict rule. If she started playing Go, go to Crete. 
From a Fenbox La Belle Helene operetta on the grand piano, it meant there was danger around and they were to hide immediately, making their way to the attic, a hidden wardrobe or through a secret tunnel to the garden. To deflect attention, the guests were all given nicknames, those of animals. These were just a few of their guests, the Kenigsween family. This family were nicknamed the Squirrels, in homage to their bright ginger hair. Not a natural hue, but instead the result of a failed attempt to make themselves blonde. Morrissey Paul Frinkel. Morrissey was nicknamed the Hamster, most often to be found book in hand, curled up in a nook of the Zabinski's house with the family's pet hamster. Magdalena Gross. Magdalena had been a friend of the family for many years. Before the war, she had visited the zoo during a creative crisis. The visit had seen the sculptress change from sculpting humans to sculpting animals. During her time in hiding, she spent hours carving clay figures of the zoo's inhabitants. Magdalena's time at the villa ended when zoo employees became aware of her presence. But after being taken to a new hiding place, she ended up in the ghetto. Antonina nicknamed her friend the Starling, writing in her memoir that she always maintained grace and strength. She would whistle, as starlings do, at her plight. Eleonora Tenenbaum Eleonora was the wife of entomologist Scheiman Tenenbaum, a man whose love of bugs had seen him travel the world to collect and study them. With war looming, Scheiman had left his collection of 300 glass boxes in the care of the Zabinskis. Then, along with his wife and their daughter, Irina, the family had ended up in the Jewish ghetto. Despite much pleading and offers of help, Scheiman could not be convinced to leave the ghetto, remaining there until his death in 1941. Learning of their friend's death, the Zabinskis begged Eleonora and Irina to participate in the escape and come to shelter at the villa until a safer spot could be found. Irina had already fled to Krakow, where she fell into the hands of the Gestapo. She was never heard of again. On a visit to the ghetto, Jan boldly took Eleonora's hand and miraculously led her through the gates. She spent the next weeks at the villa before being moved to a new hiding place. Scheiman's collection survived the war intact. In 1944, Jan's activity in the underground army at Krajor reached a crescendo when he participated in the Warsaw Uprising. His participation saw him arrested and taken to a German prison camp. With her husband gone, Antonina continued helping the Jews of Warsaw and took over her husband's efforts. Jan survived the camp and in 1949, the couple were able to officially reopen the zoo. Together they had helped shelter over 200 Jews. Their efforts saw them both honored as righteous amongst the nations during a 1968 tree planting ceremony at Israel's first official Holocaust victims memorial, Yad Vashem. Both Jan and Antonina become authors, Jan of popular science books and Antonina continuing her long-held authorship of children's books told from the perspective of animals. In 1965, Jan reflected on his actions. I took the risk and gave them shelter not because they were Jews, but because they were persecuted. If the Germans had been persecuted, I would have done the same. We are talking about people who were condemned even though they had done nothing wrong. It was terrifying. My human obligation was to help them. Just plain decency. Bonus fact. You know what they say about karma. These photographs show German prisoners of war caged in Antwerp Zoo.